Good afternoon and welcome back. In the first mini lecture regarding the death penalty, we talked about how does this fit into this frame about protection from cruel and unusual punishment. Is the death penalty cruel and unusual? Certainly if you look at the uh, Constitutional Convention and the time of our founding fathers, uh, I talked about how the death penalty was very, very common. In fact, in Britain, uh, at the time of the uh, American Revolution, uh, there were almost 200 offenses uh, that could get you executed. So certainly from a historical perspective, the death penalty uh, would not necessarily be cruel and unusual. It would be fairly common. Uh, however, if you take a look at evolving standards of decency, uh, the vast majority of democratic countries have totally eliminated the death penalty or have allowed it in very, very, very rare circumstances. Uh, to me, the debate comes down to a couple of things. Uh, for death penalty supporters, I do believe that their strongest argument uh, is that it may act as a deterrent. Uh, George W. Bush, when he was president, said, in fact, that he believed that that was the only really good argument for the death penalty, and in fact, that was why he was a supporter of the death penalty, was because he believed that it deterred murder. So certainly, if that were true, that would be an excellent uh, argument for it. Uh, I personally don't, don't believe it. I personally do not believe it acts as a deterrent. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why uh, I happen to be uh, an opponent. Uh, just to review the last lecture, uh, I said that most executions occur in the South. The vast majority, about two-thirds of executions, occur in three Southern states. That if you take a look at the countries in the world that execute people uh, on a common basis, uh, the United States is the only democratic society uh, in the world that ranks in the top ten. Uh, in executions, that the death penalty is a highly debatable topic amongst the states. 31 states have the death penalty uh, and 19 do not. And, and the Supreme Court has been highly conflicted. Most of their decisions have been five to four, and the Supreme Court has ruled on both sides of the controversy. So on this tape, I want to talk uh, a little bit about what the Supreme Court uh, has done over the last half century uh, regarding the death penalty. And I want to uh, have as the featured case study uh, in this mini lecture three cases that come out of the state of Georgia. Uh, all three of them are five to four decisions. Uh, the first two uh, I'm not really interested in for exam purposes. The third uh, of these cases I'm very interested in, and in fact it is the third case that made me a death penalty opponent, and so I will probably talk about that case uh, a lot more than the first two. Uh, but I do want to talk about all three. So if you look under 4A in your notes, Furman versus Georgia, uh, this case occurred uh, in 1972. Uh, the Supreme Court, by a 5-4 to four margin, struck down the death penalty in Georgia. Uh, Thurgood Marshall, uh, writing an opinion in this case, said that in Georgia the death penalty was arbitrary. It was like a bolt of lightning arbitrarily striking one individual and not another without rhyme or reason. So the majority's perspective was, was that this was cruel and unusual because the death penalty was random and arbitrary. Uh, the minority disagree. The minority uh, claimed that uh, if you take a look at the 14th Amendment to the Constitution, the 14th Amendment states that no state shall deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of the law. Uh, the argument of the minority was that uh, Furman got due process. Uh, that he was tried in a court of law, that the jury found him guilty of murder, and that he was sentenced to death. And so certainly uh, this did not uh, violate any 14th Amendment uh, prohibition, uh, that he was given due process, he was sentenced to death, and uh, therefore uh, the execution was legal. So 
the Supreme Court was highly divided, but for four years, uh, executions ceased in the United States. Uh, Georgia, uh, amongst uh, five other southern states, vowed that they were going to rewrite their death penalty statutes, that uh, they would be less random, less arbitrary. And, and so four years later, the state of Georgia was hauled back into court uh, in Gregg versus Georgia. And by the same five to four margin this time, the Supreme Court upheld the death penalty if administered fairly. In other words, the Supreme Court in this particular case said, we do not believe that the death penalty uh, is not per se unconstitutional. Uh, certainly, uh, if it's applied randomly and arbitrarily, uh, then yes, it might be ex uh, it might be unconstitutional. But in and of itself, the death penalty is not necessarily. It is not what we say inherently cruel and unusual punishment. Uh, and so now, in these two Georgia cases, in, in Furman, the Supreme Court five to four strikes down Georgia's death penalty, and then four years later by a five to four margin rules that the death penalty is okay. Now in both of these cases, and in fact in all cases up until 1987, the argument had always revolved around the Eighth Amendment. Is the death penalty cruel? Is it unusual? Is it arbitrary? Is it random? Etc. In the third case, which I find to be a much more intriguing case, a much more complex case. We have the traditional Eighth Amendment argument, and now for the first time the defense raises a novel and, in my opinion, much stronger argument against the death penalty than just whether it is per se cruel and unusual. Uh, even though I'm a death penalty uh, opponent, I've confess to you that I don't necessarily believe that the death penalty per se is inherently uh, unconstitutional or cruel and unusual. So now we get to what I think is the stronger argument in America against the death penalty. So in McCleskey versus Kemp, we have a man, Warren McCleskey, who's involved in a furniture store robbery. Uh, a shootout ensues, and Warren McCleskey shoots and kills a white police officer. In this case, the defense did raise the traditional Eighth Amendment cruel and unusual argument. But the defense did something beyond this. The defense raised the argument that in their mind they believed that the death penalty was also racially discriminatory. In other words, what the defense raised in this case was an equal protection argument under the 14th Amendment. The defense made the claim that Georgia was much more likely to seek the death penalty against white murder, against uh, uh, when white people were murdered rather than when black people were murdered. That Georgia was more likely to seek the death penalty against black murderers and far less likely to seek the death penalty against white murderers. The state uh, of Georgia was most likely to seek the death penalty in cases like McCleskey, where you have a white police officer killed by a black man. Uh, in this particular case, the argument was Georgia is much more likely to seek the death penalty against black people than white people. George is more likely to seek the death penalty when victims are white rather than when they're black. That Georgia is most likely to seek the death penalty against black murderers with white victims and is very unlikely to seek the death penalty when you have a white murderer with a black victim. And so the overall argument was that in Georgia, and in fact throughout the South, the state values white lives more than non-white lives. Uh, and therefore, the death penalty is racially discriminatory. Therefore, it violates the Equal Protection Clause. And therefore, uh, the death penalty 
uh, is, is unconstitutional. Now, there were several studies introduced in this case. The most famous uh, of these cases was the Baldus case. And to be fair, the studies did not agree to what degree Georgia was discriminatory. But all of the studies suggested that there was racial bias. Uh, how much? Was it three times? Was it six times? Was it 11 times? The studies didn't agree. Now, I want you to look at the quote that I've left you uh, in your notes. Even the majority, led by Chief Justice Rehnquist, acknowledged that there was a problem in Georgia. And I'll read you word for word what's in your notes. Uh, Chief Justice Rehnquist wrote, quote, Despite statistical oddities, we find no evidence of racial bias against this particular defendant. Now, here is the way that I would reword that statement. I would reword it by saying, despite the fact that there is significant racial bias in Georgia as a whole, we find no evidence of racial bias against this particular defendant. Now, I, I want to make a clarifying statement here because both statements can be true. When you say that you believe that there is racial bias as a whole, that does not mean that there's racial bias against every single individual or even a majority of individuals. When you are saying that there is racial bias, all that you are saying is there is a statistically significant difference in the way that group A, in this case, white murderers are being treated, and group B, black murders. It is very, very likely that Warren McCleskey got a fair trial, that Mr. McCleskey was not the victim of racial bias, which is what Chief Justice Rehnquist stated here, right? We find no evidence of racial bias against this particular defendant. Well, let's assume that that's true. That's a good thing. Mr. McCleskey got a fair trial and was not the victim of bias. However, look at the rest of the statement. Even Chief Justice Rehnquist and the majority are acknowledging that there is a problem in Georgia. Now, he's using a, euphem a euphemism, right, despite statistical oddities. Well, what the statistical oddities is demonstrating is that groups of people are being treated differently. Keep in mind that in McCleskey versus Kemp, this is the third time that Georgia is being hauled before the Supreme Court in 15 years. Think back to the Furman case in 1972, when Thurgood Marshall said that in Georgia, the death penalty is like a bolt of lightning arbitrarily striking one and not another without rhyme or reason. What McCleskey seems to suggest is that there is a rhyme or reason to the execution of people in Georgia, that that bolt of lightning is much more likely to strike black people, and my guess is now Hispanic people, and it is far less likely to hit white people. As soon as I read Chief Justice Rehnquist's statement, despite statistical oddities, we find no evidence of racial bias against this particular defendant, I became an opponent of the death penalty. I'm from the southern part of this country. I have seen the significant racial bias that still exists, although admittedly it is far less obvious and probably is far less widespread than when I was a child. But it still is significant. It still is a factor. And in hindsight, Justice Powell, who was one of the five justices who allowed this execution to take place in McCleskey versus Kemp, uh, after Justice Powell was retired, Justice Powell said that the greatest regret of my legal career was voting to uphold the death penalty in McCleskey versus Kemp, that this was the greatest mistake I ever made uh, during the time that I was on the Supreme Court. And if I could reverse it, I would have voted to have abolished the death penalty. 